Okay, I think I think we can we can start. So, um, hello everyone, welcome back. The uh, last lecture of this uh, set of lectures, the memorial, the Eduardo Pontão Memorial Lectures, that Professor Zachariah Chaco is uh, giving very 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 kindly accepted our invitation. And uh, I just want to say that the uh, PDF file uh, is already uh, linked in the uh, the chat of the Zoom, if you guys want to open and the notes. And uh, for those of you that uh, made it to the end of the school, I guarantee you that uh, now you'll find the answer to all your questions in this last lecture. <laughs> Chaco, <laughs> best model that describes the universe will be revealed uh, today. Um, but yeah, <laughs> something close to that. So uh, Chaco, please uh, go ahead. All right. Um, thanks, Rogerio. So let's get going. Um, so we are talking about models of neutral naturalness, and uh, models of neutral naturalness are are, are, are theories in which uh, the particles that cancel the quadratic divergence from the top loop are not charged under standard model color, and so uh, these theories are not very strongly constrained at the LHC. So. So they're uh, they're attractive from that point of view. They are not very fine tuned. They 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 meet all the data. They are consistent with uh, with all the current data, and do a good job of solving the the hierarchy problem. Right. So that's what we are talking about. And I had just finished telling you guys that if you want to construct a model of neutral naturalness, the symmetry that protects the Higgs mass should be something that doesn't commute with the color group of the standard model. I'm going to just now the rest of this particular topic, neutral natural. I'm just going to discuss one concrete model to give you a sense of how this works. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the mirror twin Higgs model, MTH. Okay. So, so consider a scalar field H, which transforms as a fundamental under a global SU4 cross U1 symmetry. The potential for H takes this uh, usual Mexican hat form, right? So the only difference between this and the standard model is that uh, the symmetry is now SU4 cross U1, not SU2 cross U1, but the form of the potential is the same. So then what happens is the global symmetry is broken to SU3 cross U1, and we have seven Goldstone bosons. So we parameterize the VEV of H as uh, F, right? Um, right? So this F will be the, the VEV of H. Now, what we are gonna do is we are going to gauge an SU2A cross SU2B subgroup of the global SU4 cross U1, right? Uh, and the, 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 the direction we are headed is that eventually we are going to identify SU2A with SU2 left of the standard model. And SU2B is going to be what we call a twin SU2. Remember, it's the mirror twin Higgs model. So this SU2B is going to be what, what a, a twin SU2, all right? And I'm going to explain what that means in a minute. Okay? But, this, but this SU4 has two SU2s in it and uh, we gauge them both. One of those SU2s is the SU2L of the standard model and the other is this twin SU2. So under the gauge symmetry, this, this H decomposes into a doublet of the first SU2 and a doublet of the second SU2. And eventually this doublet HA is what we are gonna identify with the standard model Higgs, right? And HB is what we're gonna call its twin partner, right? It's the twin partner of the standard model Higgs. So now the Higgs potential is going to receive quadratically divergent contributions at one loop from the gauge interactions. Uh, this is embarrassing. I've forgotten the lambda squared here. Okay, there should be a lambda squared here and a lambda squared here. Okay. But this is quadratic, you get a quadratically divergent contribution like this, all right? And the idea 
is that you, now here's the idea, you impose a Z2 twin symmetry, okay? call it a twin symmetry under which A and B can be interchanged. So that means that GA is equal to GB is equal to G. Then this simplifies and it becomes like this. Okay. And again, there's a lambda squared that's been forgotten here. But uh, the idea is that this, this thing is invariant under SU4 cross U1. Okay, this is invariant under the full global symmetry. Okay. Remember this thing is an S, this thing, this thing is uh, coming from the gauge interactions and the gauge interactions break the global symmetry. Okay. But in spite of that, the quadratically divergent contributions respect the full SU4 cross U1. So you can, this term can completely be absorbed into this M squared term. This is just a correction to this M squared term. And so um, this cannot, this will not give any mass to the Goldstones because it respects the global, the full global symmetry, right? So in spite of the fact that we have gauged a subgroup, we have explicitly broken the we have explicitly broken the global symmetry. It's a hard breaking. In spite of all that, the quadratically divergent contributions are not going to give a mass to the Goldstones. Okay. So what's going on here? Okay. So this is different from the collective symmetry breaking we studied earlier. What's going on here is that as a consequence of this discrete twin symmetry, the quadratic terms in the Higgs potential respect the larger global symmetry, okay? And it's happening because of this twin symmetry because I equated GA and GB, okay? That was a consequence of this in A to B interchange symmetry. Once you, they're equal, then this falls into this nice form. So what's going on is as a consequence of the discrete twin symmetry, the quadratic terms in the Higgs potential respect the larger global symmetry even though the gauge interactions constitute a hard breaking of the global symmetry, the goldstones are prevented from acquiring a quadratically divergent mass. So now what I want to show you is that the mechanism can also be employed to cancel the quadratically divergent contributions from the top you cover. So what we add, now have to do is we have to add to the theory uh, twin top quarks. Okay. And uh, so the Yukawa couplings look like this, this QA, TA, everything with an A is a standard model object. Okay. And everything with a B is a mirror or a twin object. Okay. Nothing on the B side carries charge under the standard model. It doesn't carry color, doesn't color, carry SU2, doesn't doesn't carry U1, right? The only relation between A and B is this interchange symmetry, the Z2, the twin symmetry. So while QA and TAC carry charge under standard model color, QB and TBC are assumed to carry char charge under a twin color group. So they have their own QCD color, right? They have their own U1, their own SU2, their own SU3 color, right? And this top you cover coupling is equal to that top you cover coupling because of the A to B interchange symmetry, right? And also our color group is related to their color group by the interchange symmetry. So once again, you can calculate the quadratically divergent contributions to the Higgs potential. And, uh, and once again, okay, what you'll find is that uh, since none of the QA or TA talk to the QB or TB, you're just gonna get uh, mod HA squared or mod HB squared, okay? You're not gonna get anything else. And so you're gonna get exactly this combination. And once again, this combination is invariant under the full SU4 cross U1 global symmetry, right? Even though the top you cover, this interaction, these interactions don't respect the SU4 cross U1 symmetry, right? This is invariant only under SU2, under an SU2 subgroup, and this is invariant under a different SU2 subgroup. 
So this interaction breaks the SU4 cross U1 global supersymmetry. But in spite of that, and you actually calculate the quadratic divergences, you find a contribution that respects the full global symmetry. So this thing, just like in the gauge case, this thing can be completely absorbed into this SU4 cross U1 invariant master. Okay? And since this potential respects SU4 cross U1 global symmetry, there's no quadratically divergent mass for the gold stones. Uh, All right, um, so, so you know, of course the gauge interactions and the Yukawa interaction, they do break the global symmetry. So they will lead to a mass for the goldstones. It's just that, that the, those masses are not going to be quadratically divergent. Okay? There's only gonna be a log divergence, just like in the case of the collective breaking. Okay? But the critical difference now is that these particles, which are the top partners, right? don't carry any charge under standard model color. So they can't be produced easily at the LHC. In fact, very hard to produce them because not only do they not carry color, they don't carry R weak interactions or R electromagnetism. So it's almost impossible to produce these things at the LHC, right? And, um, and yeah, so the bounds on these are very weak. And so uh, these things could still be quite light, right? And uh, that could, you know, give a, Compelling explanation of uh, uh, compelling explanation for why we haven't uh, seen any top partners at the LHC, right? Okay, um, so let's uh, let's see how this cancellation arises in uh, in the low energy theory of the Goldstone bosons, right? So we parameterize the Goldstone bosons in this way. We write pi, we call them pi x is pi a x t a, where a runs over the seven broken generators. And we can parameterize pi like this. So there are three complex uh, scalars h, right? So each of these has two real pieces. So it's, these are six, right? And then there's a new, there's a, um, a real guy, which is the seventh. So H1, H1, H2, H3 are complex, H0 is real. Okay? And then this object, okay, uh, made out of the Goldstone bosons, transforms linearly under the unbroken group. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, transforms linearly under SU4 cross U1. And we can use it to write down the low energy Lagrangian for the Goldstone fields. And uh, even though there are seven goldstones in here, I really only care about the thing which is gonna become the standard model Higgs. And that's H1 and H2. So these H1 and H2 in here are gonna become the standard model Higgs and I'm gonna call that H. That's the Higgs tablet of the standard model. Okay, so this is the top you have a coupling, right? It has a nice A to B symmetry, which means this YT is equal to that YT. Now expand out HA and HB in terms of the Goldstone fields. And I'm just gonna keep track of that little H. And here's what you get. You get something that is just like the usual topic cover coupling. This is the topic cover coupling. And then you get a coupling of H, you get a funny coupling of H, a non-renormalizable coupling of H to the, to the mirror uh, top quarks, to the mirror colored quarks. Okay. And this should remind you of the collective symmetry breaking we saw in the last class, because there again, we saw a funny non-renormalizable coupling of the Higgs to the top partners. And that's happening again. So you're getting a funny non-renormalizable coupling of the Higgs to the top partners, right? And the mass of the top partners is also proportional to YT. And so once again, you start, you draw the, 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 the loops that contribute to the Higgs mass at, at one loop. And you find this usual diagram from the, the usual diagram that's there in the standard model. But now you get this diagram okay, that makes use of 
this non-renormalizable vertex, which is proportional to the top you cover, and this chirality flip, which is proportional to the top you cover. So this scales like yt squared. This scale, this diagram scales like yt squared. And this minus sign comes through. This factor of two is taken care of by, uh, by, by a symmetry factor. And um, so the, the quadratic divergences in these two diagrams cancel exactly. And the diagrams have, if you go back and look at our collective symmetry breaking, the diagrams have exactly the same form, that the vertices are the same as in collective symmetry breaking. Uh, they, the diagrams look the same. The critical difference is in the collective symmetry breaking case, these quarks were charged under standard model color. Whereas now in the twin Higgs, they are charged under a mirror color. So in the collective symmetry breaking, these quarks could easily be produced at the LHC. We haven't seen them. So that theory is very constrained. But in the twin Higgs case, these are only charged under a mirror color. In fact, they're not charged under any of the standard model forces. And so it's very hard to produce these in these at the LHC. And so this theory is relatively unconstrained. Uh, Yeah, so the, the top part is a charge, not under standard model color, but under different twin color group. Uh, and, and you can check that the twin symmetry that protects the Higgs mass does not commute with standard model color. Okay. Uh, so to see that, for example, you know, let's say you uh, let's say you rotate, let's say you rotate, you do an, a color rotation. So you rotate, so let's say you have a, a quark in here that's red and you rotate, you do an, a color rotation. So you rotate it to, to blue and then you do a, 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 a twin transformation. Okay? You end up with uh, the blue is ro rotated to uh, mirror blue under the Z2. Okay? But let's say you do, um, uh, Um, a little puzzle here. Um, so let's say you rotate uh, a red cork here. Uh, uh, it goes here. Um, so red quark here goes uh, to a red quark here. Yes, okay. So you will rotate a red quark here. So, so I, I'm, I'm trying to do the two operations in sequence. Okay. So I do an SU3 color rotation here. If I start with red, it becomes blue. And then I do a Z2, the blue goes to mirror blue. But if I do the op op operations in the opposite sequence, I do the interchange symmetry first. I send red to mirror red. But now if I do the SU3 color here, okay, this, uh, nothing is happening here. So this stays mirror red, okay. So if you do the, the exchange operation first and then the color rotation on standard model SU3, you don't get the same thing as if you do the, rotation on standard model SU3 color first and then the uh, um, uh, uh, twin uh, exchange. So it's in that's, that's why we can have we, in a theory like this, you can have top partners that don't, uh, that, that don't, that are not charged in the standard model color. Okay, let me stop here and uh, take questions. Okay, um, there's a question from Percy Caceres. He's asking the non renormalizable term in the top you call to be obtained from a UV completion theory. Uh, yeah, just, just remember that uh, in a theory with Goldstone bosons, right, any theory with the Goldstone bosons, right, is going to have uh, terms like that. Okay. 
because the symmetry breaking scale, uh, you know, is because you're writing the low energy effective theory, right? So, uh, so the low energy effective theory has a cutoff, right? And so you're always going to get non-renormalizable terms suppressed by the powers of the cutoff, okay? So just because this is the low energy effective theory, you're going to have terms like this. So this is the low energy theory of the Goldstone bosons. Yeah, but the theory that he started with was UV complete. Right. So if you look at the th this theory that we began with, uh, this is completely renormalizable. So it's only when you, when we integrate out the radial mode and we remove the radial mode and uh, integrate it out and you have a low energy effective theory. And, uh, and, uh, and, and since it's an effective theory with a, with a, with a, with a cutoff, which is really the radial mode, uh, that's why we are getting these uh, non-renormalizable terms. Um, and so Divta is asking, is there anything that can constrain the twin doublet? I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So I don't see any questions, so we can proceed. All right, so I think we are done with this set of lecture notes. Now I think it's time to move to the, the, the next set of lecture notes. Uh, so, uh, so in realistic uh, mirror twin Higgs models, the discrete Z2 uh, twin symmetry uh, is extended to all the particles and interactions of the standard model. Okay, so, so, the, so, the, so the Z2 symmetry is crucial for the cancellation, right, of quadratic divergences. So the idea is, is now when you're building a complete model, you have to extend the Z2 to all the particles of the standard model. Right? And uh, so then what it means that we have a mirror copy of the entire standard model. So standard model we see is just half the particles. There's an entire mirror copy that we are not seeing, which has exactly the same field content and interactions. Okay. Although the mirror particles are light, right? Um, they have never been seen because they they carry no no charge under any of the standard model forces. They are, they are all they could be all around us, but they are invisible because they don't see they don't feel our forces. So very difficult to test at colliders because it's hard to produce something which is not charged under any of the standard model forces. But there, it is still possible to test these theories and, and uh, this is related to the question that was asked. So after electroweak symmetry breaking, what will happen is the Higgs and its twin partner, the twin Higgs, right, mix. Then what happens is the production cross-section for our Higgs is suppressed by the mixing angle, right? And that's one, that's one thing that happens. So you, don't produ you won't produce as many Higgs as, as you would uh, in, in, in the standard model, okay? Because there's a mixing suppression in this twin Higgs model. And this mixing also allows the Higgs to decay into invisible mirror states. So sometimes when you produce a Higgs, it's not gonna decay into the standard model particles. It's gonna decay because it's gonna, because it's mixing with the twin Higgs, it, it can decay into mirror stuff, okay, twin stuff. All right, and because of that, because both these effects go in the same direction, they contribute to a reduction in Higgs events into all standard model final states because you're not producing as many Higgs as you would have because of the mixing suppression. And when you produce a Higgs, sometimes instead of going into standard model, it goes into some mirror particle, which you don't see. Okay? So you don't see as many Higgs events into gamma, gamma, or ZZ as you would at the LHC, okay? as, you, as you would in the standard model. And because of that, the LHC can place limits, okay? and the limits are really on the mixing angle. Okay? The mixing angle cannot be too big. And um, it turns out the mixing angle is related to the, to the tuning in the model, okay? So 
to make the mixing angle small, okay, uh, to, to, to agree with the LHC bounds, you want to make the mixing angle small. But if you make the mixing angle small, to make the mixing angle small, you have to make the, 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 the mirror top quarks and the mirror gauge bosons heavy. Okay, and then you start bringing back fine tuning, right? And so the bounds on the mixing, so the LHC places limits on the mixing angle and indirectly uh, places limits on, uh, indirectly places limits on the masses of the, uh, the, the, the mirror particles, right? Uh, but still, this is these bounds are quite weak compared to you know the direct production bounds, right? Even now, the the top partners could be as light as 500, 600 GeV, okay? and uh, even probably even by the end of the LHC run, even after high Lumi LHC, etc., probably the fine tuning will only be like one part in ten or something compared to one part in a hundred for the collective symmetry breaking or for the supersymmetry or something. Okay. Now, the cosmology of mirror twin Higgs is complicated okay, because now you have all these extra light particles and you know they, they, they could mess up cosmology. But uh, consistent frameworks do exist. Yeah, and in some of these frameworks, things like the mirror neutron can be the dark matter, right? Uh, the mirror twin Higgs, only stabilizes the hierarchy up to about 5 TB. And that's because the cancellation really only works at one loop, okay? After that, there are finite effects, not quadratically divergent, but finite. And those finite effects are not small, okay? So above five, 5 TV, you need some ultraviolet physics. So above 5 TV, you need either supersymmetry or, compo or the Higgs to be composite. Okay? So there are composite twin Higgs models or supersymmetric twin Higgs models. Okay? And um, so, so in a composite Higgs model, instead of using collective symmetry breaking to keep the, 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 the Higgs light, uh, lighter than the compositeness scale, you could, you know, you, you could use um, the twin Higgs mechanism, for example, okay? instead of collective breaking, right? And the bounds would be quite a, the, the, the bounds would be a, a quite a lot weaker, right? And um, similarly, um, in supersymmetry, right? Instead of having the top quark at, uh, you know, 500 GeV, you could have the top quark at two or three TeV. Uh, sorry, the top, uh, the top, uh, the, the stop, the, the super part of the top. Instead of having it at uh, 500 GeV, you could have it at two TeV or something. And below two TeV, you have something like uh, the mirror twin Higgs coming in. So you could put the whole mirror twin Higgs into a supersymmetric framework and uh, reduce the fine tuning, right? So these are some of the ideas that are out there to kind of solve the hierarchy problem in a, uh, without having a, a lot of residual fine tuning. And it can be and something like, something like neutral naturalness can be embedded either into the composite Higgs or into the supersymmetric framework. Right? Okay, so let me stop here and ask if there are any questions. Um, so Sudipta is asking, can one accommodate dark matter uh, within twin Higgs doublet model? That was before you mentioned the uh, yes, dark Yes, so you can, and there's, there's several ways to do it. So there are many, many versions of these twin Higgs models. So I, I, I mentioned the simplest one, which is the first one to be written down, but there's, but there's many versions of these things. And, um, so, so in this minimal version, the, the only real dark matter candidate is the, the mirror neutron. Okay. If the mirror neutron is lighter than the mirror proton and you have a baryon asymmetry, the mirror neutron can be the dark matter. Okay. And in fact, there's quite a lot of papers written about this. I think I saw one just this week. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting dark matter candidate because um, um, you know, so because it, it has self interactions, right? It's a self interacting dark matter. So in principle, it could solve some of these, you know, problems with small scale structure and things like that. Then in some of these uh, other uh, there are different versions of these twinning models and some of them, the, the mirror bottom or the mirror tau can be uh, dark matter also, right? 
And so there are several different versions which, uh, which can give rise to dark matter. Okay. So, so Dipta is also asking if these new um, particles contribute to the relativistic degrees of freedom and fasten the expansion of the universe. Yeah, so that's one of the big complications. So that's what I refer to as uh, it's complicated because of the extra light states, right? Now, it turns out that um, the standard model and the mirror sector, they decouple from each other at temperatures of order a, a GeV. So after a below a GV, the two sectors are not in thermal equilibrium anymore. So what's required to fix the cosmology in this kind of minimal model is to find some way of increasing the entropy in the standard model sector without doing the same in the twin, in the twin sector. And there are ways to do that using the, so, so, so you, you need to find a way to introduce neutrino masses into the standard model, right? And uh, so you have, so when you do that in a twin Higgs framework, so what, what can happen is that the mechanism which generates the neutrino masses also has the effect of heating up the standard model at late times. And that allows you to satisfy the bounds on the expansion of the universe. Okay. But it's a little bit, it's, it's, it's elegant, but it's a little bit complicated. Okay. There are other frame, there are, that's, there are other ideas out there for how to do that. And then, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it is an issue and you, you, you have to think seriously about it. Okay, and Percy Cassidy is asking, extra dimensions can also reduce the fine tuning wing models? Um, no, extra dimensions don't really help you in this, in this particular context. Okay. Um, the reason is that, uh, if you put the standard model into an extra dimension, there are bounds on what are called the Kaluza Klein resonances, right? And uh, those bounds tell you the extra dimension has to be above five T, it has to be above five TV or something. Okay? And so the extra dimensions don't actually help you in the context of twin Higgs models. But on the other hand, if you're embedding the twin Higgs into, you know, if you have a composite twin Higgs model, right? where the Higgs is a goldstone whose mass is being protected, not by collective breaking, but by the twin mechanism. And then that composite twin Higgs model will have, a, will have an ADS dual, will have an extra dimensional dual. And people have constructed those models, right? And it's, you know, it's fairly well studied. So, um... The students really want you to solve all the problems of the universe. So Sudipta is asking, can matter, antimatter also be explained in this model? Um, uh, so the, the matter antimatter asymmetry, um, the, there are people have addressed it in the mirror in the in the mirror twin Higgs framework, yes. People, I think at this point, pretty much every problem, somebody's tried to solve it in the mirror twin Higgs framework and, uh, and, the, and, and, and there are solutions, yes. Um, some, of the, some of these models, they generate the baryon asymmetry and the dark matter at the same time. So the asymmetry in, on our side gives us the, uh, gives us the uh, our baryons and the asymmetry on that side gives us the dark matter. Yeah, so people have people have uh, tried to do that. Yeah. Can Can you say a few words about the calculability of the Higgs mass? Um, the calc the Higgs mass is calculable up to uh, log divergent, so it, it's logarithmically divergent. So the quadratic divergences are removed; it becomes log divergent, and so it's calculable kind of up to log divergent contributions. Okay. So usually you cut off those logs at five TV and then there's a finite piece left over that you can't actually calculate. Right? The comp so if the log divergence is cut off at say the compositeness scale, or maybe if you're, you're embedding it in SUSY at the, also the super partners, right? And um, then there'll be a matching piece also which you, which you can't calculate. Okay. Uh, Francesca has a religious question, but I think that's better at the end of the, uh, at the end of the course. Is that okay, Francesco? So I hope it is, it's okay. Um, you can continue and we, we go we come back to Francesco's question at the end. 
Okay. All right, so let's move on. I really do want to talk about uh, axions because so, so, so many of the exciting idea papers that I see on the archive nowadays are about axions. So I really want to say a little bit about it. Um, okay, so, so, so the axion, it was or, it's originally proposed as a solution to the strong CP problem. So let me first try to explain what the strong CP problem is. Okay, so I'm gonna begin in a kind of roundabout, a kind of indirect way, right? So the lightest hadrons in QCD, as you know, are the three pions, which have masses of order 140 MeV. So the, the, the lightness of the pions is a consequence of the fact that they are the pseudo Nambu Goldstone bosons arising from the spontaneous breaking of uh, approximate symmetries of the QCD Lagrangian. So I, I think you guys must have studied this, but let me let's let me briefly review it. So, so here's the QCD Lagrangian for two light quark flavors. So you have the kinetic, the gauge covariant kinetic term, then this gauge covariant is really ENM because at low energies that's all you have. And then you have this mass term for the light quarks. And here Q is both U and D, and QC is U C and D C. And, um, and this M is a mass matrix for the up, which contains the up quark mass and the down quark mass. Okay. Just some uh, shorthand notation for the uh, Lagrangian of the two light quarks. Now the point is that this Lagrangian has an approximate SU2L cross SU2R global symmetry under which Q transforms under SU2L, that's U and D left transform under SU2L, and uh, QC, that's U, UC and DC transform under SU2 right. Um, okay, so there's this, uh, so that's really the kinetic terms which have this symmetry, okay, which is really a symmetry of QCD. And, uh, but this symmetry is violated by the mass terms because MU is not equal to MD. And it's also violated by electromagnetism because the electric charge of the up is not the same as the electric charge of the down. So, you, so if you, when you rotate them into each other, electromagnetism doesn't like that. But it's, this is a good symmetry of SU3 colors, a good symmetry of QCD. Not a good symmetry of the mass term, not a good symmetry of ENM. Okay, now when QCD gets strong, it develops a condensate. That means uh, it, QCD gets so strong, it's able to pull quarks and antiquarks out of the vacuum. So uh, the, the, the vacuum of our universe contains a condensate of uh, quarks and antiquarks, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so this is, the, this is the order parameter. Okay. So SU2 left cross SU2 right, is broken down to the to the vector SU2 left plus right. Okay. Uh, and uh, there are three goal, there are three SU2L has three two three generators. SU2R has three generators. This has three generators. So there are three Goldstone bosons. And the three pions are the three Nambu Goldstone bosons arising from the symmetry breaking pattern. And they are pseudo Nambu Goldstone bosons, not 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 honest Nambu Goldstone bosons, because uh, the mass terms this mass term breaks the uh, SU two L cross SU two R symmetry, and E and M also breaks the symmetry, and that's why the pions are not exactly massless. Okay. So this is the standard story which you must have seen in your in your course in your textbooks open any textbook, this will be there. Right? However, there's a puzzle, right? And the puzzle is that if you stare at this Lagrangian for a minute, you will see that it actually has more than the two, it, will it actually has more symmetry than just SU2 left and SU2 right. It actually, this thing actually has a symmetry and the U1 baryon number, okay? Q and QC have opposite charges, and this is obviously invariant under baryon number. Okay. And 
that's no surprises there, Bergen number is a symmetry of the whole standard model, not just of this. But it's also invariant under an axial symmetry, okay? It's got a U1 axial symmetry under which uh, Q goes to E raised to I alpha Q and QC goes to E raised to I alpha QC. So the difference between baryon number and axial symmetry is that the baryon number Q and, uh, and QC, Q and anti-Q really have opposite charges. Under the axial U1, Q and QC have the same charge. Okay, so you're rotating in, you know, them together. Okay. Now, the U1 baryon number remains unbroken when this condenses. Okay. And this is why, of course, baryon number seems to be a, a very good accidental symmetry of the standard model. It's not broken. Okay. But the U1A is broken when this condenses. Right? And so it looks like there should actually be four pions, not three, right? Because there's this, this, there's, there's U, this U1, this U1 axial, it's a symmetry of that Lagrangian, you can check. When this condenses, this thing has charge under U1 axial, okay? Uh, and so when it condenses, the U1 axial is spontaneously broken and there should be a Goldstone boson. And so there should be a fourth pion, not, not just the three that we're seeing. Okay. And this was a problem for a long time. Nobody could understand where this pion had disappeared to, right? And this was called the axial U1 problem, right? Uh, this problem was there long enough for it to get a name, right? Um, okay, but now we know the answer, right? And here's the answer. It's also in your textbook. The reason why there is no fourth light pion is that U1 axial is not actually a, a symmetry of the theory because of a quantum anomaly, okay? So the thing is the way we decided that U1 axial was a symmetry of the theory is that we looked at the Lagrangian and we stared at it and we said, oh, I can rotate by U1 axial. See the Lagrangian is invariant. Yeah, there's a fourth symmetry, right? But that's not enough, okay? When you're talking about a quantum theory, you have to look not just at the Lagrangian, but you have, uh, uh, and you not, ju not just at the Lagrangian, you have to look at the whole path integral. Okay? And the, there's a measure in the path integral. Okay? There's a measure in that path integral. And, and you have to ask the question, is not enough for the Lagrangian to be invariant. The measure in the path integral also has to be invariant. Okay? Actually, strictly speaking, the combination the combination of the Lagrangian and the measuring the path integral has to be invariant. Okay? So that's different from a classical theory. In a classical theory, all that matters is the Lagrangian is invariant, it's a symmetry. Quantum theory, that's not enough. It's the, the quantum theory, you know, there's a path integral involved and you have to ask the question, the combination of Lagrangian plus measuring the path integral, is that invariant? Okay? And the trouble with this U1 axiom is that the Lagrangian is invariant, but the measure in the path integral is not. And so it's not an honest, it's a symmetry of the classical theory, but we live in a, in a quantum universe and it's not a symmetry of the quantum universe. Okay? It's not a symmetry of the quantum theory. Okay, so this is what I just said. Uh, consequently, when you do these axial symmetry transformations, okay, so what happens is, when you take into account the change in the measure of the path integral, you can take that change and absorb it into a term in the Lagrangian, okay? And so what happens is that you do this change, the measure in the path integral changes, you absorb that change into a new term in the Lagrangian, and you find that uh, now the measure is, is the same, but you have this new term in the Lagrangian, which is this thing, okay? And uh, this G dual is defined with this factor of a half. Okay? I got to tell you when I was preparing these notes, the, the two hardest things were to figure out these factors of a half and the bloody minus signs because uh, I, I couldn't find a single reference that had actually done it correctly to the end. And so if anybody knows one, please tell me, okay? I think I've fixed all of it in these notes 
but probably everybody who wrote those previous things thought so also. So yeah, that's not a convincing proof. Okay, but uh, yeah, so uh, uh, user beware. Okay, I think I've done it all right, but uh, okay. So uh, and the so the, the idea is that when you do these transformations after taking into account the change in measure of the path integral, the Lagrangian actually changes, right? And this is why U1 axial is not really a symmetry, okay? Uh, this is why there's no fourth point. It's because U1 axial is not really a symmetry, okay? If you do everything carefully, taking into account the measure in the path integral, the Lagrangian is not actually invariant. It shifts by this amount. Okay, all right. Um, all right, let me, maybe I should stop here and ask for questions. Any questions? Yes, so uh, Miguel, he's uh, asking, could you please explain a little bit why the measure of the path integral is not invariant under the U1 uh, axial symmetry. All right, that's not, I, I can't explain it to you because it's not so simple, okay? It's a calculation in your textbook. It's called the Fujikawa. It was originally done by a Japanese physicist called Fujikawa. I, I actually, I assume he was Japanese. I don't know that for a fact. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, it's called the Fuji, the, the, the Fujikawa measure. Okay? And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a section of your, of your quantum field theory textbook, either say Srednicki or Peskin or something. You will have to look it up. Okay. I'm, I'm going to have to assume you know that because it's actually not very simple. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Miguel is saying that he looked he looked that he looked that up. Okay. Yeah, I think you can move forward. Okay. okay. So now. Uh, what you see is that when you do this transformation, you generate a term like this in the Lagrangian. So let's ask the question, let's say there's a term like this in the Lagrangian. Let's say we started with a term like this. Okay. What does it do? Okay. Now the first thing you stare at it, you can actually prove that this term is actually a total derivative. It's very easy to show that if, these, if this is an abelian field, okay, if it was E and M, it's very easy to show that FF dual is a total derivative. For QCD, it's a little bit more work. Okay? But this term is actually a total derivative. And you know that total derivatives in perturbation theory, they never matter. Okay? You, you, you can include this term in the theory if you want, and you can draw, draw diagrams that involve this term. But those diagrams, the amplitude will vanish exactly when you impose momentum conservation. Okay. You can try. Okay. There are diagrams, it's just that they contribute exactly zero once you put in momentum conservation. Okay. And that's because that total derivative gives you an overall momentum, right? And when you, you know, out in the, in the amplitude and when you impose momentum conservation, boom, it all goes to zero. Okay. So in perturbation theory, you never need to worry about terms like this. Okay. But, you know, you know, physics is, you know, quantum field theory is not just perturbation theory, especially when you come to a strongly coupled theory like QCD. Okay? And it turns out that this term has effects non perturbatively and physical quantities like the vacuum energy and the electric dipole moment of the neutron actually depend on the, on this, on the value of this parameter theta. Okay. Uh, I'm just claiming that now, but in a few minutes, we are gonna be calculating the vacuum energy as a function of theta. Okay. And then you'll be able to see with your own eyes that uh, physics does depend on that. Okay. okay, so we have just seen that under an axial rotation, okay, like this, with QC invariant, theta shifts like this. Okay. So what that means is that there is more than one way to write the same theory. Because whatever the value of theta is, I can rephase my quarks and I get back the same theory, except that theta has now shifted. 
Okay, so there's multiple ways to write the same theory, right? So, so the only thing which is physical, uh, it's very annoying to have to deal with, uh, you know, you know, we got to be sure we are talking about the same theory, right? Otherwise, it's it's a headache, right? So the only thing that's physical is this combination, theta, theta bar, which is defined as theta plus the argument of the determinant of the quark mass matrix. Okay. This combination, you can do any shift you like like this. This combination doesn't change. Okay. This combination theta bar is a physical quantity. Okay. That's the thing that stuff actually depends on. Because if you just write theta, um, you know, by itself, you can always change the value of theta, you know, theta is this term. You can just, you can always change the value of theta by uh, rephasing the quarks, right? So to, to have something which is actually physical, I need to tell you both what is the phase of the quark mass matrix and the value of theta. Okay? And specifically what I need to tell you is this combination. This is the physical combination that doesn't change when you do this transformation. All right. Now, if any of the quark masses is zero, uh, basically theta, really theta bar can be set to zero and is unphysical. Okay. Uh, you can, if any of the quark masses is zero, you, you first go to a basis in which the quark masses are diagonal and one of the eigenvalues is zero. Then, uh, uh, you uh, you rotate all the massive quarks, uh, the, the, their phases away to set, you know, so that there, there is no phase there in the quark mass matrix anymore, and all the phases in uh, theta bar, and then you rotate the massless quark to remove theta bar, and because it has no mass, nothing happens. Okay? So it sounds complicated in words, but if I assigned it as a homework problem, all of you would figure it out in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, if any of the quarks is massless, uh, you can rotate theta bar to zero and theta bar is just, just zero. Okay. Uh, it's not physical anymore. But, but if all your quarks are massive, okay, which, is the case, which uh, is, seems to be the case in the standard model, Theta bar is physical. All right. Now, a term of the form um, theta g g dual violates CP. Okay, and you 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 can check, uh, you know, uh, um, how g and g dual transform under CP. Okay, it's it's also true if you if you write a term ff dual for the photon, it also violates CP. So it's the same for gluons. A term like this violates CP. And therefore, if theta bar is non-vanishing, and this is the critical thing, there is a new source of CP violation in the theory. Okay. If theta bar is non-vanishing, there is a new source of CP violation in the theory. It's not just the, you know, the standard model, we always say the only source of CP violation is the phase in the CKM. Okay. If theta bar is non-vanishing, that's not true anymore. There's another phase. There's a new source of CP violation in the theory. Okay. Um, yeah, you must be wondering why am I calling theta bar a phase all the time, right? Why, why is it a phase? Why, why, why is it a phase? Why is it not just a parameter? But the point is that, uh, you know, I can rephase by two pi, right? And get the quark mass back to the same form, right? And so, so theta is really def only defined modulo kind of two pi. Okay, so um, that's why I keep talking about it as a as a phase. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So. It can be shown that theta bar feeds into the electric dipole moment of the neutron. The non-observation of any such electric dipole moment, so people have spent a lot of time looking for the electric dipole moment of the neutron. 
And so we know that theta bar is less than 10 raised to minus nine. And that's, if you think about it, that's crazy. Okay, that's completely crazy. And let me tell you why, right? This theta bar, let's see what it is. It's a, it's a combination of this strong phase theta. So it's a combination of the theta from this term and the phases in the quark mass matrix. Now we know the phases in the quark mass matrix are big because the CKM is big. The CKM came from the phases in the quark mass matrix. We know the phases in the quark matri mass matrix are big. So if I add this theta, which I have no idea, is it big or small? If I add this theta to some phase from the quark mass matrix, and I know the phase in the quark mass matrix are order one, how the hell can this be 10 raised to minus nine? when I know that a bunch of phases in here are out of one, okay? That's crazy, right? That's crazy, right? But that's data, right? You know, don't like this universe, find another one. Right? This, is, this is real data. <laughs> so, so this is a, this is a, uh, so this is the strong CP problem. So this is the strong CP problem staring you in the face. Okay, uh, since the phases of the quark mass matrix generate the large phase in the CKM, we, we think theta bar should be order one. Instead, it's less than 10 raised to minus nine. Incredible, okay. And as far as, as far as we know, there's no anthropic reason for theta bar to be so small. I mean, maybe theta bar can't be order one or something, but if it's like 10 raised to minus four or five, I don't think any physics changes, you know? So we don't really know why theta bar is so small. All right. So the simplest solution to the strong CP problem is if the up quark mass is zero. Okay. Then as I said, theta is unphysical and can be rotated away, right? It's no strong CP problem. Okay. And this seems to be ruled out by lattice data. And there's still some argument going on, but I, I think most people agree that this is not a, this is not how the world works. Okay, that's just not zero. There's another class of solutions that involve having CP as an exact symmetry in the ultraviolet, so that theta bar is equal to zero at high energies. Okay, so you just say CP is an exact symmetry of the theory and. Uh, it's spontaneously broken to give the CKM, but at high energies, really there's no CP violation. And so theta bar is zero, okay? Okay, well then there's a challenge. The challenge is to break CP spontaneously and get a, a huge CKM phase without simultaneously giving a big theta bar, okay? And that's not easy, okay? But people are clever and they have done it, okay? There are models like that. And what they're taking advantage of the fact that in the standard model, the RG running of theta bar only happens at seven loops, okay? So the CKM really only feeds into, the CKM phase only feeds into theta bar at seven loops, okay? And so if you can cunningly arrange break CP in such a way that it exactly goes into uh, this, the, 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 this, the, 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 the CKM phase, but not into theta bar, then uh, at low energies, you're safe because in the standard model, the running only arises at seven loops. Okay? But it's not so easy to do, okay? Because usually you need to add extra particles to the theory and now there are extra phases and you know, it, it's, it's a mess. It's, this is not an easy game to play. So, a third class of solutions to the strong CP problem involve the axion. Okay. And the way these theories work is by making the value of theta bar depend on the web of a dynamical field. Okay. So the, val the effective value of theta bar now depends on the value of some field. And that field is what we call the axion. Okay. And then if the minimum of the potential for the the effective value of theta bar being zero, okay? 
then the strong CP problem is solved. Okay. That's the axion solution. And the rest of this lecture and basically the rest of this course is gonna be about discussing the, the axion. Okay. So let me stop and ask if there are any questions about the strong CP problem in general. Yeah, there's a, another religious question by Francesca. So I get to the first one later, but this second one is related to what you said. Um, I said religion because anthropic principle can be a religion. <laughs> Since you cited it many times, can you give us an honest reference about the anthropic principle? Uh, um, I tell you, I tell you what, I don't know an honest reference off the top of my head. Um, but I'll tell you what I'll do. One thing I should have done, but I haven't done, is I, I, should, I should give you guys a list of references from which I obtained the material for these notes, because almost none of it is my own you know, original research, right? And so at some point, um, maybe in the next day or two, I'll send Rogerio a list of, of, of references from which for every topic I covered, and I'll include a reference to the uh, anthropic principle one, okay? Uh, yeah, at some point there were debates about the, the anthropic principle. Remember yeah. Lenny Susskind, the debating with uh, David Gross. I, I bet you can find those debates in the internet these days. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I don't see another question, so this is... All right. Okay, so let's talk about the axiom. So before introducing the axiom, let's first determine how the vacuum energy depends on the value of theta bar. Okay. So I told you the vacuum energy depends on theta bar. Let's see exactly what the dependence is. It's convenient to begin in a basis in which the theta term has been rotated to zero. Okay, so let's start in a basis in which the arg argument of the determinant of the quark mass matrix is zero, so that the entire dependence on theta bar is contained in the phase of the quark mass term. Uh, did I say that right? Okay, so basically I'm saying that I am rephasing the quark mass matrix so that to set the theta term to zero. And so now the, the, the quark mass matrix has an overall phase. And so the, the which, is, which depends on theta bar, right? And uh, the theta term is zero. Then the Lagrangian for the two light quark flavors uh, looks like this. So you have the gauge covariant kinetic terms. And remember, this is just ENM because I'm at low energies. And then I have a mass term, okay? And this mass term is now um, a, a real thing, which is just MUMD with MU and MD real. And I have this theta bar explicitly outside. And the only uh, phase in the whole thing, everything is real, except for e, this E raised to I theta bar over two, okay? This is the only source of CP violation in this QCD Lagrangian at low energies. Yeah. Uh, now, as, I, as, we, as we said earlier, when QCD gets strong, SU2 L cross SU2R is broken to the diagonal SU2. We have three Goldstone bosons, which are the pions. And uh, yeah, okay. So everything is exactly as before, except now we are being super careful about this M. We are saying that this M, previously we, we took it to be real. Okay, we were sloppy about it. We took it to be real. Okay? But now what I'm telling you is it's actually a real number, a real matrix times a overall complex phase, which depends on theta bar. All right. So, um, so then, uh, we can parameter, so the Goldstone bosons are contained in pi. Okay? The, the, the Goldstone bosons are pi, uh, the, the three pi ohms. And we can construct this object U defined in this way 
which transforms linearly under SU2L cross SU2R and can be used to write down the low energy Lagrangian for the light ions. Uh, okay, so we can, this object transforms linearly. So it's convenient to write down interactions for the, for the pions with, with U. Under SU2L cross SU2R, U transforms uh, in this way, L U R dagger, right? And uh, the web of U is what's breaking uh, U down to the diagonal L plus R. Now there's an explicit breaking, there's an explicit breaking of SU2 L cross SU2 R by the quark master. Okay? And uh, because of that, the quark master is going to give a potential, it's going to give a potential for the for the for the for the pions. Okay. So the pions, you know, if, if they were exact Goldstone bosons, the pions would have no potential. Okay. All their interactions would be derivatives. But because the quark master, and of course electromagnetism, the quark master breaks uh, the SU2L cross SU2R symmetry explicitly, explicitly violates that symmetry, there's going to be a potential for the for the for the Goldstone bosons. And there's a trick we can use to determine how the mass parameter M appears in the low energy theory. Okay? And what we do is uh, we promote it to a spurium that transforms in this way. Okay? So the thing is, so M of course is just some parameter. This is just some parameter. Okay? Um, we want, to we want to figure out how does that parameter appear in the low energy Lagrangian. So the thing is to realize that, that if M, if, you know, if M transformed in this way, if M transformed in this way, this Lagrangian would be fully invariant under SU2 left cross SU2R, you know, ignoring E and M. So if M transformed in that way, the, the, this Lagrangian would be invariant. Okay. It's because, um, um, but, but you know, uh, M is just a parameter, it doesn't actually transform, right? M is just a parameter. But if it transformed in this way, the theory would be uh, invariant, okay? So just pretend that M transforms in this way pretend that M, for example, was a field or something that transformed in this way. And uh, then ask, use this transformation to figure out how M would, uh, can appear in the low energy theory. Because if the, if the UV theory is invariant under, is fully invariant under this kind of a transformation, the low energy theory will also be invariant under this transformation, okay? It's a spurious symmetry. And if it's a spurious symmetry of the UV, it's gonna be a spurious symmetry of the IR. Okay. And what you find is that this restricts the way M can appear in the low energy theory. And uh, in particular, M appears, the leading order to, to linear order in M, M appears in this way, okay? Because this term is formally invariant under this transformation of M when uh, U transforms like this. Okay. So if U transforms like that, and this is a spurious transformation of M, uh, this is how uh, M appears to, lead to leading order in the low energy theory. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going through it a little bit quickly because I'm assuming that you guys have seen this in your standard model courses, okay. because you, 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 you need to, be, you should have seen how the pions appear. Uh, uh, the, the, how the, the gelman renner Oakes formula, the famous gelman renner Oakes formula for the pions appears uh, from uh, the chiral Lagrangian. Okay. So that involves a, the, exactly this term. Okay. So, uh, so this in the end is the, uh, is the leading, is, is the, lead, uh, the leading interactions for the Goldstone bosons in the low energy theory. Okay. So it's, it's a kinetic term. Okay, and uh, there's a, 
I'm ignoring ENM. I've ignored ENM. That's why these are not gauge covariant. So there's a kinetic term and there's also a potential term. Okay? And this is a parameter A, which is undetermined at this point. Okay? You can relate A to the masses of the pions. Okay? A is just a constant. It's related to the mass of the pions. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so the next step is to use this potential to determine the vacuum of the theory. Okay. Now the point is that this mass parameter M, it's actually complex now because of this theta bar. It's this m hat is real, but this theta bar is, is because of the theta bar, this parameter m is complex. Okay. And with theta bar not equal to zero, what we what you're gonna see is that when we minimize this, okay, when we minimize this, the vacuum is no longer going to be at pi a is equal to zero. Okay. The vacuum is gonna be in a place where pi three, that's the neutral pion, actually has a web. Okay. Uh, that's what I'm going to show you in a second. Okay. Uh, so uh, the potential that has to be minimized is uh, this one. Okay. Uh, and writing it out explicitly, uh, this is what you have where m hat is now real. Okay, and I should say that the parameter A is real uh, because in the limit that theta bar is zero, the theory has to respect CP. Okay. And so if A was complex, uh, remember this, this, this parameter A is independent of the value of M. Okay. It's determined by a matching calculation or something in principle. And uh, it's independent of the value of M. And so when M is real, there's no CP violation. And so A has to be real. And so when M is complex, uh, A is still real. It's independent of the value of M. Okay. And so this is the thing that has to be minimized with non-zero theta bar, right? And you guys have probably all done this uh, in your uh, field theory classes when theta bar is zero. Now we have to do it when theta bar is non-zero. Okay. So define pi hat A is equal to this thing. And then there's a formula that you remember from your quantum mechanics classes, or you can look it up in the textbook by Sakurai. Uh, U is then this object, and the exponential of something which depends on the Pauli matrices is this. Okay, this is a formula from, uh, for, you know, from the rotation of spinners in quantum mechanics that I'm now applying here. Then the trace of M times U is uh, this thing, right? And uh, I, I like what I say here. It is clear from this that only pi three can acquire a, a, a web, okay? It's clear once you have stared at it for five minutes, okay? <laughs> It's not so clear if you're just staring at it for 10 seconds. But uh, uh, the reason only pi three can acquire a web is that uh, the dependence on pi plus and pi minus is quadratic. So the dependence of pi plus and pi minus in here is quadratic. Similarly, the pi hat cancels the pi hat here. Okay? And the remaining dependence on pi plus pi minus is quadratic and similarly here. So the, the, the only linear dependence is on pi pi three hat. And so when you, you turn on theta bar, pi three hat gets sourced and gets a web, okay? Whereas pi plus, pi minus don't get webs, okay? I'm saying it in words, but spend a few minutes, stare at this and convince yourself that what I said is true, okay? I, I, obviously it would take me a lot of algebra to show this, but I claim it's true. Okay. So I'm going to define phi as the web of pi three hat. And so we have to minimize, we have to minimize this potential to determine the web of phi. And when you set 
pi plus pi minus to zero and only turn on pi pi three, this thing is a lot easier. So the thing that has to be minimized is this thing. Okay. So phi is appearing here and here. And then uh, you can write it out like this. I'm being very explicit because it, you know, because uh, my notes are, 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 are really not just for you. They're also for me. And you know, uh, I, I keep, get, keep getting dumber from year to year. And so I don't know, but the next year I'll be able to reproduce it. So uh, I always write everything out explicitly. So the minimum of the potential, you can minimize it. And uh, 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 this, is what you, uh, this is what you find. I should say there's a pretty good uh, derivation of all this in the textbook by Srednicki, Mark Srednicki, which used to be available free on his website. I don't know if it still is, okay? So he told, he, I once chatted with him and he told me he has absolutely no problem with anybody downloading it free from his website. But except that someday the publisher might find out and make him take it down, right? So I don't know whether it's still up or not. So if it's still up, uh, you have his permission to, to, to download it, all right? And he actually has a very nice derivation of all this, except that it has a few typos. For example, I think he has mu minus md, and I'm quite sure I'm right. It's md minus mu for this formula. Okay, okay. but he, his is a textbook and he has more steps than me. So uh, you might wanna take a look at this, at his textbook. Okay. And so then you minimize the potential and uh, you find that the vacuum energy at the minimum is given by, so you have to take this thing and substitute it in here. And uh, there's quite a lot of algebra. Okay? There, there really is quite a lot of algebra in going from, uh, uh, from, from here, pl plugging it in here and here. The final result is a lot simpler than the intermediate algebra. Okay. Um, so this is what you get. And the square root actually extends all the way over this whole thing. This whole thing is in the square root, right? And uh, so you see that the value of the vacuum energy of QCD does depend on the value of theta bar, okay? So, so, so once you're talking about non perturbative physics, like the value of the vacuum energy, it is a function of theta bar okay, as advertised. So let me stop here. I'm about to introduce the axiom. So before I do that, let me stop here and ask if there are any questions. Okay. So um, there is one. So what is the meaning of spurious symmetry? The spurious symmetry is, um, it's not a real symmetry of the theory. Okay. It's not a symmetry of the Lagrangian, but but there's a parameter in the Lagrangian, which is M. And if, if M transformed in this way, okay, uh, it would be a symmetry. And it's not a real symmetry because M has some value. Okay? M is some M U M D, it has some value, right? And so uh, that's, uh, you know, the, the, those parameters have some values, you know, they, 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 uh, but if then, if, if that matrix M transformed in this way, it would be a symmetry, okay? And uh, you can use spurious symmetries to determine how parameters appear in effective Lagrangians, okay? So if it has a spurious symmetry, the, I, the, the effective field theory will also have that spurious symmetry. Okay, any other questions? Okay, Chuck, I don't see any other questions, so okay. go ahead. All right, so now let us introduce, finally, let us introduce our friend, the axion. Okay, so the axion is a field that enters the theory that, that couples to G, G dual like this, okay? So you have the usual theta term, but now I'm adding an extra term uh, 
uh, a of x over f a, where this a of x is a field called the axion. Okay? So the axion is any field that couples like this, the gluons like this. Okay? Any field that couples like that is called an axion. Okay? Now, notice that this theory also has a spurious symmetry. Okay, so if so if theta goes to theta minus alpha and a of x goes to a of x plus alpha f a, this, this is invariant, okay? And again, this is a spurious symmetry because theta is a parameter, it has some value, okay? So this is not an honest symmetry, okay? But, uh, um, but it's a spurious symmetry. If, uh, if I, if I say that if I if if theta transformed like this, if theta transformed like this, and a of x transformed like this, this would be a symmetry. So I can use this to determine how a of x appears in the low energy theory. Just like I used the spurious symmetry to determine how m, the mass parameter, appeared in the low energy theory, I can use this spurious symmetry to figure out how the axion appears in the low energy effective theory. Okay, so um, so uh, you think about it for a little while and you realize that the low energy theory before it had theta bar times trace of m hat u. And now the theta bar contains theta. So the spurious symmetry is now there is really theta bar going to theta bar minus alpha, a of x going to x plus alpha a. So the axion appears in this combination, theta bar plus a of x f a, okay? So any coupling of the axion, which is not a derivative coupling, uh, will appear in this combination, okay? So, Previously, we saw that theta bar, previously we saw that theta bar appeared here, but now there's an axion and they have, there's, a, there's a spurious symmetry that connects theta bar and the axion. And so the, the, the com only the combinations which are invariant under that spurious symmetry can appear in the Lagrangian. And the combination which is invariant under the spurious symmetry is this combination. This is the combination which is invariant under the spurious symmetry. And so that's the combination that enters the low energy effective Lagrangian for the ions, right? And now we can once again, go through the exactly the same calculation we did before. We can go line by line through the same calculation and we can find the vacuum energy of the theory as a function of this field A of X. Okay. And I wrote all these notes and I, when I came here, I found a disaster, complete disaster. Okay. And it's hilarious and I wanna ex explain it to you. Remember there was that constant in the chiral Lagrangian, which I called A. I should have called it B because I'm using A for the axiom. <laughs> you know, these mistakes you make at the notation in the beginning, when you're doing handwritten notes, they just curse, you know, there's just a curse, right? And I just couldn't bring myself to rewrite these notes with B instead of A. I'm sorry, guys, okay? So this A is not the axion, it's the, it's this, uh, uh, it's this A that enters right in the beginning in the chiral Lagrangian. I should have called it B. I made the mistake of calling it A. And I, I, I kind of have to call A of X the axiom because that's what everybody calls it. You know, I don't want to change my notation from everybody else in the world. Okay? But nobody else in the world calls this A, okay, for a very good reason. <laughs> I'm sorry, I really am. Uh, but I have to tell you, you know, when I, I was when I was making these notes, I was using a set of lecture notes. And that guy also called it A. And then I wondered how the hell did that guy avoid this problem? But the thing is he converts this into something that depends on the pion mass 
early on. So the A disappears before it reappears as the axiom. Okay. Anyway, having apologized, uh, um, you stare at this potential and this is the only place that the axion appears. Okay. The axion only appears here. Okay. And uh, if you minimize this potential, you find it's minimized when this combination vanishes. Okay, but it's exactly that combination which determines the CP violating phase. This is the this combination is the CP violating phase. So the potential is minimized when the CP violating phase is zero. So the so the dynamics of the theory is such that this light field, the axion, rolls down to the point where the CP violating phase is exactly zero. And so we have solved the strong CP problem, okay? At the minimum of the axion potential, that's exactly the point at which the strong CP phase vanishes. The parameter FA is called the axion decay constant. It's a name, right? So you should know the name. Everybody calls FA the axion decay constant. It, parametri it parametrizes the strength of the axion interactions. So you can, so we know the potential for the axion, it's this thing. So you can take two derivatives and find the mass of the axion. And you'll find the mass of the axion is, is two powers of lambda QCD over the axion decay constant. Very schematically, I'm ignoring all pi's and two's and things. Now, there are very strong bounds on the, on the axion decay constant from things like meson decays and stellar cooling. Okay. And uh, so the constraint on FA is something like 10 raised to nine GV. Okay. And then if you take the estimate for the axion mass, uh, you find that the axion mass is less than about 10 raised to minus three EV. So the axion is a very light particle. It's very light and very weakly coupled, okay? Um, now, let me, uh, now there was a question about, uh, in, in, you know, in the, uh, before the lecture started, there was a question in the question and answer section about uh, the, 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 the coupling of, uh, the, 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 the coupling of uh, the axion to, to photons, right? And what's actually happening, remember, uh, what's actually happening here is that um, uh, when the pion gets a web, okay, when the pion gets a web, it actually, uh, uh, so, so, so if you have axion dark matter, what's happening is that it's oscillating, it's actually oscillating about the minimum, okay, axion dark matter is the axion field oscillating about the minimum. And what that corresponds to is that we are living in this cold condensate of axions, okay? And uh, what you'll find is that, uh, uh, like we were calculating the minimum of the expectation value of pi three here, right? What you'll find is that uh, 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 there's actually axion pi three mixing, okay? And because of that, because the, 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 the neutral pion, as you guys know, decays to gamma gamma. Because of that, the axion through its decay, through its mixing with pi three can also decay to gamma gamma. And that's what was being, uh, so it, it, it actually inherits a coupling to gamma gamma from the pion. Okay? And that combination is all, that's always there. Okay? You can't get rid of that, right? And, um, uh, um, you, you can't get rid of the, the, the coupling of the, 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 the axion to gamma gamma through the pion. Okay? You can try to get some other effect from somewhere else, UV effect to cancel that, okay? but that usually needs tuning. Okay? And so usually the axion, in addition to its couplings to gluons of order one over FA usually has couplings, well, unless you fine tune is expected to have couplings to the photon 
through the mixing with the pi on of order one over f, right? So let me stop here and ask if there are any questions. By the way, this is the end. Okay? I don't have any more material because I, at some point I realized I wouldn't be able to get beyond this. I hope I've just covered the essentials here. Okay, very good, very good. There's a question by Sudipta. How lambda QCD comes in the mass of the action to the potential, uh, though, although the potential does not have, uh, the potential that they're minimizing does not have lambda QCD? I, I didn't hear that. So the question is how lambda QCD appears uh, in the expression for the oh, action mass. Oh, I see, I see, I see. If oh, I see, because you see what happens is that this F pi is the axion decay constant, okay, which, you know, parameterizes, parameterizes the strength of the pion in, uh, sorry, this F pi is the pion decay constant, which parameterizes the strength of the pion interactions. Okay? And this, uh, so actually, um, this particular combination, okay, remember, uh, Remember this 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 combination is actually um, this call. So let's let's go back a little bit. So 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 let's recall the mass of the the axion is coming from this combination. And this combination is actually, uh, you know, it's 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 really coming from here, which is the potential for the pions in QCD. Okay. So uh, you know what the pion masses are in QCD, and so it turns out that this can be related to a combination of the pion masses and the pion decay constant. And it turns out that this is of order like the pi on mass to fourth power or something. Okay? And that lambda QCD is coming because of the uh, pi on masses. Okay? Um, that's really where it's coming from. Okay, Lucas Magno is asking above the FA scale, could we have CP violating processes in strong interactions to a non zero theta value? If this is uh, if this scale is after inflation, could we use this to sort variable symmetry? Um, so, okay, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, let me think about that. That's a good idea. I don't know if somebody's done it. <laughs> I, I, I don't see any reason why you can't get... Yeah, so usually what happens is the axion in the early universe is not sitting at its minimum, it's stuck somewhere. Okay? This is called a misalignment mechanism. And uh, at some point when the temperature goes, falls you know, low enough so that the, the mass is bigger, you know, in the early universe, the Hubble constant is above its mass at late times, the Hubble constant, the temperature falls, the Hubble constant becomes, becomes below its mass. And then the axion starts rolling down and starts oscillating about the minimum. But in the early universe, the action is stuck away from the minimum. So yeah, so in principle, there is a source of CP violation there. But uh, yeah, you have to be a little bit careful because, um, because at high energies, you've got to remember that QCD is weakly coupled and it's perturbative. And so in perturbation theory, that theta term doesn't really do very much, right? So it's you. So that theta term really becomes important for non-perturbative effects, and at high temperatures, usually non-perturbative effects are you know usually perturbation theory works well. So I think that maybe that is an obstacle. Okay, but I don't want to say it's not possible. People are clever, and you might be able to come up with a model that does something. Yeah. That's a good idea, actually. I would spend a, a little bit of time thinking about it. Yeah. The, the, the... Oh, if I may, so the, so the, theta, the theta term is a total derivative, but when you put the action field, it's not a total derivative anymore. Right, but the action, but you're not using the dynamics of the action, and the action is stuck. Ah, yeah, so in that case, you're right, yes, of course, yes. Okay, uh, so if there are no more questions, I go back to this uh, philosophical question.
is it? So yeah, so she has a religious question. If you were starting your career now, which I suppose she's doing, uh, on what, what of the models you're explaining to us would you bet? Which model, I guess, which model would you bet? Is that the question, well, Francesca? You can, if you want to, if you want to ask yourself, maybe you can ask better than, than me reading. So she says it's correct. So, okay. yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough time to be starting. Okay, so let me tell you what my students are working on. That'll, that'll give you some idea. <laughs> right, here's what my students are doing. I have two students. Uh, uh, both of them are doing projects in cosmology on large scale structure, right? Uh, I think that's gonna be, uh, I think looking for new physics in cosmological observables is gonna be a big deal in the next decade because a lot of the new experiments are, are coming up there. And so uh, both my students are each doing projects related to that. Um, and then um, uh, one of my students is doing uh, several projects. He, he actually knows neutrino physics pretty well and he's doing several projects in that. I'm not necessarily involved in those projects. He knows a lot more than me about neutrino physics but he's a clever guy and he's working with people at Fermilab and, and places. So he's doing that. Uh, the other student is not doing that mostly because he's just starting. Uh, then both of them are working with me on a project involving uh, and two different projects, but uh, involving uh, theories in which the neutrinos get mass because they are partially composite at low energies. Okay. So the neutrinos are not element, you know, so the neutrinos are not completely elementary particles. But they're they're the they they kind of they kind of mix with strongly coupled states, okay? and so they have come they, they have they they have an admixture of compositeness in them, okay? and so there are a lot of tools that you that you can use from composite Higgs model building and composite neutrino model building, okay? and it's a way to give neutrino mass. Uh, it's a way to give neutrino mass and uh, give neutrinos masses. And it's very, very testable at colliders. It has very interesting signals at neutrinos double beta decay, at mu to e gamma, mu to e conversion. Okay. And, so the, and uh, what I like about it is it, it, they're gonna learn a lot of theoretical tools and they're gonna learn ADS CFT at the same time because uh, um, uh, I'm kind of making them work it all, all out in, in, on the CFT side, and then I'm making them work it all out again on the ADS side. And I want them to really understand how everything, how the correspondence works and it all matches up. Okay. And, the, and uh, the younger guy also gets to learn neutrino physics, okay, which is a bonus. Okay. So these are the kinds of, kinds of things. I like my students to do, you know, so like this neutrino composite neutrino project, it has a certain, requires a certain amount of technical skill. Okay? You have to know ADS CFT really well. You have to be able to do certain kinds of CFT calculations, right? You know, processes in which standard model goes into CFT states. You have to understand how to calculate certain kinds of correlation functions in the CFT, at least scale them, things like that. And so it requires a certain amount of technical skill. Okay, and so when I give my students a project, I'm looking for something that requires serious technical skill, but also has a result which will maybe have some impact. Okay. So uh, that's what I would say, try to find projects like that in areas which are uh, interesting. Okay. So oh, um, Percy Cassidis is asking, can you comment more about the mechanism to obtain a lower mass of the neutrino in the neutral naturalness as twin model, quirk twin model, etc.? Yeah, so it just turns out that if you just do the 
if you just do the, the naive seesaw model, which is the simplest model of neutrino masses, but you, but you do it at a, at a scale of about one GeV. So the right-handed neutrinos have masses around one GeV or something. Then it turns out that the right-handed neutrinos, de, you know, they, they are initially thermalized, but they go out of the bath and they, but they decay at late times and they decay after the mirror particles have decoupled, but they decay preferentially to the standard model. Okay. And that's because of the various mixing angles and things like that. So they decay preferentially to the standard model. So both the right-handed neutrinos of the standard model and the twin right-handed neutrinos, they decay preferentially to the standard model. And so the standard model gets heated up, the, the mirror sector doesn't, and um, the cosmological bounds are satisfied. Okay. So Sudipta is asking if you can discuss the, pro the, the problem of problem set one. So I don't know if you asked this, uh, asked this question during the, the uh, question and answer, um, but um, let me. Uh, let me. Okay, so this is homework one. So specifically. So do you have anything specific? Uh, maybe you can, can, you can just uh, open your microphone and, and ask. Now, what is the specific question? Hello. 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 So actually, how to write the mass term when uh, this uh, s quark is uh, singlet under SU two and also it is singlet under uh, just 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 write yes. it write it in QED write SL bar SR. But how to give uh, a mass to that I means Higgs is doublet here, but uh, SL, bar SR write... is a SL bar SR is a mass, right? He just what is, what is the mass in QED? How do you write a mass term in QED? Okay, okay. okay you are talking about only this is SL bar SR with M, M exactly. of S, something exactly. like that. Exactly, that's a mass term. Okay, so I means I am talking uh, thinking that how to uh, means actually we are write the mass term with his tablet when uh, our uh, left hand rate yeah, is no, uh, so you, can't, you, can't, you, can't okay. write, you can't write such a mass okay, term. Okay. So okay, there, okay. there are so some mass looking... terms. So, so this theory is going to have some mass terms, going to have some mass terms with the Higgs doublet, and it's going to have some mass terms which don't have the Higgs doublet. Okay, and that's okay. why there are flavor changing neutral currents. There's only one Higgs, but this theory will have flavor changing neutral currents because some of the masses are not related to the Higgs. Okay, okay, that all. Thank you, sir. Okay, any other questions for Chapel? Okay, so I don't see uh, any more questions. Oh, there's one from, by Miguel about, maybe I missed that one. Yes, so Miguel is asking, uh, this one. Yes, he's asking, uh, the mass parameter M is from promoted to a superior. And there is a, there is a, a mention, there's mention that the electromagnetic effects are ignored. So which are these possible electromagnetic effects and why they are small due to the small coupling to the axions? So I guess he's asking why you can neglect the electromagnetic effects. Well, just think about Q, just think about the pion masses in QCD. So the, so the pion masses are order 140 MeV and the mass splitting between the pions, between the charge pion and the neutral pion is about a couple of MeV, okay? That couple of MeV is the electromagnetic because the charge pions are, are, have, electro, have charge, right? The neutral pion has no charge. So if you look at the masses of the pions, only two MeV of them, of the mass, only the two MeV mass splitting is the electromagnetic correction. 
most of the mass is coming from the fact that the quarks have mass. Okay. So I'm neglecting that two MeV kind of mass splitting between the charged pions and the neutral pions. Okay. That's the electromagnetic correction. It's, it's not difficult to put it in. Okay. In fact, I could make a homework form where you put it in and you guys would, would be able to do it. Okay. But um, it's a very small effect and um, yeah. The, 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 the mass fitting between the charge pions and the neutral pions is E squared over 16 pi squared times, uh, times lambda squared. And if you estimate that, you will see you get exactly the two MeV mass fitting between the, the, the charged and neutral pions. That's what, but yeah, you can estimate and it's small. Uh, okay, so so Miguel says that he understands and thanks you. Okay, so um, uh, Sudipta is asking if the right-handed neutrino has mass of one GV, then that can give correct light neutrino mass. Yeah, so you need the the, the so you need the Yukawa couplings of the you know you need the Dirac Yukawa couplings to be small, but uh, yeah, I mean yeah, but you know it still works. Okay, so I think it's getting late. Um, so I really would like to thank uh, Chaco for this wonderful set of lectures. Uh, and these are the uh, Eduardo Bonton Memorial Lectures. I'm, I'm sure Eduardo would have loved this lecture. This is exactly the kind of physics that uh, he was very much involved with. Uh, and I want to thank all the participants, all the students uh, for the questions, for participating. And uh, this was uh, very, very nice. Um, and yeah, so this is the <laughs> this is the end of the school. <laughs> so I, I wish you all good luck in your careers, and um, and and we have uh, other schools. If you're interested in cosmology, we have another school in cosmology uh, February, also with uh, CDP. So yeah, many people are thanking you, Chaco, in the uh, in, in oh. the uh, chat, and and hope to see you guys around, uh, hopefully in person next time. Take care. And, uh, stay actually, actually, let me say one thing. I want to thank yes. you, Rogeri, and all the organizers of the school. And, uh, you know, great school. I'm pretty sure I, I learned more preparing these lectures than the students. <laughs> I, 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 I apologize for that. This is, this is always but, the case. <laughs> but, uh, but I want to thank all the students as well uh, for participating and making it a, a very lively thing. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for all and uh, hope to see you sometime soon. Okay, bye bye to all. Bye. Thank you.